Well, we're glad to be here tonight, and we have a We've really practiced a whole lot. If y'all are here earlier, you got your hair's practice, you know what we did. So. But we're glad to have uh, two of my brothers that don't usually show up come tonight. The baby of the family, Mark, on the end over here. He lives on the commune there at Walnut Grove. And then our brother Gary, who's the foreigner, lives in Paisley, Scotland. So. Glad to have him on for a few days. And so we called him in, all of them in to come tonight. Or Bob did, said she was going to cook. Unless they showed up. So. <laughs> so here we is. And this is what you get.
just a tremendous delight to be back here. Uh, I can't tell you a time of, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. <laughs> I love it. I, I really enjoy being back here. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, it's been fantastic to be back, to see some sunshine. I have overdosed on more, more food than I can even begin to describe to you. My mother, uh, morning, noon, night, before bed, in between meals, is constantly feeding me. I could, if I don't watch it, gain 15, 18 pounds in three weeks. It's, it's not fair. I love it, but uh, she's taking really good care of me and I've, I've enjoyed being back. I hadn't been back for a while. Uh, I guess the last time was when dad passed, wasn't it? Uh, so it's, it's really good to be back with you tonight. I, I was laughing, Mark was, uh, <clears throat> He, we were just chatting before because he could hardly even talk tonight. And he said, there is no way <laughs> that I'm going to sing a solo tonight. I said, hang on. You know, Scott's going to just in the middle of this thing tell you to do it. And sure enough, you did. <laughs> it just never fails. So you never know what you get when we get up here. And we'll practice a song uh, just enough, maybe do a half of a verse and maybe part of a chorus just enough to get a feel for it. Scott says, let's not over-practice that. And see, we've not sung for two years. And, uh, oh, uh, I know, yeah, it's, it's obvious. I didn't have to tell you that, did you? I, uh, I live in Scotland. Uh, my home is here, I have to tell you. I, I do that because I feel like God really wanted me uh, and my family to move there. I, I get to work with a lot of young people Young adults, uh, been working with them for about 12 years now. We bring, it's uh, working with a charity called Youth with a Mission, YWAM, where we bring in uh, teenagers, young adults from all over the world. We train them for a few months, send them on a couple of months of mission, a total of five or six months of training, heavy discipleship, and it's just something that we feel like that God really called us to do. And I was the national leader of Youth with the Mission Scotland for several years. And now I'm getting to uh, do more travel than I uh, had before. Uh, I've been spending quite a lot of time the last few years in Norway, interestingly enough, and I don't know why that works out. I guess you go where you get invited, right? And I've really enjoyed the Nor Norwegian people. Uh, they're just an amazing bunch, and God just seems to really work there. Traveled into Romania quite a bit, 
been about 15 times into Africa the last uh, few years, and so I get to travel quite a bit. But now, as a, uh, over the last year, I'm uh, heading up a, a ministry in Glasgow City Center called uh, Street Pastors. Now, we don't go and preach in the streets, but we now have about 120 street pastors just in Glasgow. And uh, it's, a, it's a growing movement. And what we do, we go out at night, Friday and Saturday nights. We, we ask our people to go out one night a month because it's quite an intense night. We go out at 9.30 at night. Uh, we meet at, uh, at a university in city center, Glasgow. And we go out at 9.30 to 4 in the morning. Uh, the city has uh, about 65 to 100,000 people coming into city center every weekend. I can't even imagine that. Uh, you think about, well, I don't know how, what the population of Springfield is, but yeah, so uh, two-thirds of the population of Springfield going into downtown Springfield. Can you imagine on any given weekend? It's just a, a bedlam almost. The city never shuts down, and at 3 o'clock in the morning is our busiest times. Because when the pubs and clubs and, and uh, clubs release, they have to shut down at three. And the streets, there's one street that's about a quarter of a mile long. It's called Saki Hall Street. And on that street, on, at three o'clock in the morning, there's still 15, 18,000 people. And you know, sometimes we can't even walk down the sidewalks uh, for the amount of people. And we're there working with the police and they're begging us. Uh, I, I just still can't get my head around how this works. But we have over 35 churches uh, supporting us. We have the Strathclyde Police, which is the whole of the police of Scotland, uh, loving our work there. And also the government are saying, we want you. And in fact, the police have been asking us, uh, give us more time. Uh, we're out every Saturday, every other Friday night in the heat. There, the police told me the other day, I want you out every Thursday, every Friday, every Saturday. I want you on the West End. I want you in Shawlands. And so the police are seeing that the church, believe it or not, actually makes a gigantic difference. I had a police chief tell me the other day that he says, we think you save more lives than the police do. Amen. And uh, so for the first time ever, I think I'm seeing the church actually engaged in society in a way that's making a, a radical difference. Now, we don't preach, but we share our faith all the time. And by and large, a lot of that is by invitation. And uh, on any given night, we will sh talk about Jesus to people on the streets eight or ten times. That we, they will sometimes come to us and pray, want to say, would you pray with me? Now this is in the midst of hundreds of people around. They'll stop us and, and we'll pray with them right in the street, out loud, uh, with them. And, and it's just an amazing thing to see what happens. We have, uh, uh, our street pastors have probably stopped eight or ten suicides in the last oh a few years we we deal with a, a whole lot of vulnerable young people they'll get too drunk and don't know how to get home and we'll work with them if they're injured uh, homeless we give them hats and gloves socks uh, they're the ones that just love us to pray with them and we wear we wear kind of uniforms it's a big street pastor sign on the back we wear ball hats with street pastors on the front everybody knows us and the police will actually, now we wear police monitors, and the police will actually call us and say we need a street pastor at Saki Hall Street and Hope Street. We'll go there, and they'll just turn over the situation to us because we can do things that they cannot do. Now, so the church is relevant, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is relevant. Now, we have to sort out how we do that, and we have to figure out ways how that works in Springfield or someplace else. That really does work well in Glasgow, and we're we just commissioned another 20 street pastors the other day, and um, uh, it's it's just been really good. So that's some some of the things that I do. We've we've been safe. We've never had an accident until two weeks ago, and I just want to start that out. Last two weeks has been a tough tough couple of weeks for us uh, all over the world, hasn't it? We had uh, 26 people hideously assassinated and murdered which I just can't get my head around that one can you uh, I've tried it, it just it does make no sense to me a uh, random killing like that I had one of our street pastors two weeks ago actually tonight uh, was on the street they were we give out flip-flops 
to young girls. They wear stiletto heels. You know how they are. They can use them as weapons, but after they've danced a while, they can't walk. And so they'll be walking barefooted on the streets. We've hand, handed out last year about 3,500 pairs of flip-flops. Just give them away. Random acts of, of kindness, you know. But with uh, the, the team that Neil was on the other day, was they were giving out some flip-flops. And a fight broke out just 10 or 15 feet from him. And he, uh, he stood up and did what he was supposed to do. He, he held out his hands and said, stop, you know, because there were six guys, had a guy down just beating him. We don't know what would have happened. Neil got a bit close. They did stop, but when he turned to help the guy, one of the guys came around and, and hit him uh, really hard in his jaw and eye. He's got a fractured jaw and uh, his cheekbone is broken in three places. And uh, so our innocency was broken. You know what I'm saying? We can't say anymore that it's, it's safe. Uh, it's been safe for five years. We put about 500 hours uh, in the streets every month. And it is typically totally safe. But just that one random thing kind of breaks everything, doesn't it? And so my heart has been grieving over that, knowing what to do. The media picked it up. They called me immediately and said, uh, we heard that one of your street pastors was attacked. And I said, yeah. So we, we gave him, them a, a report, and it came out in the major Glasgow newspapers. But the, the bottom line is, God causes that to work for good. Now, did God cause that? Okay. Not a chance. Not a chance. But can God turn that into something good? Absolutely. Now, how God does that, I don't have a clue. But I've watched it in my life. And every time I get to a place where I don't quite understand a situation. Have you ever been there? Where things look difficult and hard and painful. And you don't think you can take another breath or another step. And you're weeping on the inside and, and saying, God, where are you? At that moment, somehow. The gracious gift of the Holy Spirit steps right up and, and helps us in the middle of those situations. So it's been a pretty difficult two weeks for us trying to deal with evil. Now I've got some kind of honest news and some kind of really good news. And I was really wrestling with whether I should even share this tonight, but I'm going to. And you can throw rocks or whatever you want to. And Scott may have to bail me out afterwards and fix my theology. <laughs> but I, he's got the privilege to do that. Uh, but Governor Daniel Malloy in Connecticut uh, said the other day, he said, evil has visited this community. Did you hear that? And I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. Not only has evil visited our community, there's, there's a lot of darkness is it getting easier? Is light getting brighter these days? I don't think so. And it feels like it's getting more rough, doesn't it? Does anybody else feel that same way that, that I do? Uh, and I think if I really look at it honestly, I have to say that's exactly what the Bible talks about, that things are going to get worse and worse toward the end. And But you see, in the middle of that, we have some tremendous hope. So how do we make sense? And can I just talk to you a minute tonight? I, I don't know that I've got a sermon. Is that all right? Uh, can I just talk to you a minute? Uh, how do you make sense out of evil people attacking good people? Like Neil. How do, I can't make any sense of that. The newspaper couldn't make any sense of that. How in the world can uh, a, a group of people trying to make our city safe be attacked by a person? They, they could, even the world can't get their head around that one. And I, I have to say, where was God when, where Neil, when Neil was attacked uh, on the streets of Glasgow? Where was God when evil visited Newtown, Connecticut? Well, uh, let me just talk a little about that uh, and, and give you a little of my theology, if, if, if I could. And I'm, I'm not going to get very deep on this at all. But I've been trying to make sense of this. Uh, why are we here? What is this thing going on called evil? How do we deal with it? How do we process it? What do we do with the things that, that are almost impossible to deal with and even get our heads around? Well, here's kind of the start of that logic for me. Uh, 
there in Revelation 12, and Scott and I were just chatting about Revelation this week. <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, chapter 5. He, we were having a good discussion down in the barn uh, three or four days ago uh, where John was weeping. Remember that story that Scott taught? And I wish I could have heard the whole series. I, I told him the other day, I said, Scott, you're getting better all the time. I don't know where you're getting these sermons, but they're good, you know. <laughs> Uh, you, you should be really proud of him, guys. I, I, not that he's just my brother. But he was, talk, he was talking about John on, uh, on, in the book of Revelation. And there was a moment there when there was a scroll that no one could open. And John started weeping. He started crying and grieving over the fact that this scroll could not be opened. And Scott and I were just chatting about it. I, I thought this thing, and we came to the same conclusion, that this scroll contained the future of mankind, the future of the planet, the future of animals, the future of redemption, that where evil would be dealt with finally, where wrong would be righted again. And John could find no one. He looked all over heaven. And couldn't find anyone who could take this scroll and open it. Because that scroll was the future. And so he's weeping bitterly. And I think that is some of the... I'm going to talk about in a moment in, in Romans 8. That that's some of the grief that I have in my spirit. That I groan almost at times for my redemption. Have you ever, have you ever just wanted... Uh, to see the fulfillment of this thing and justice to come. And I do. I'm desperate for it. But there in Revelation, so John saw that and he was grieving. But then someone said, yeah, there's someone. <laughs> and we'll get to him. That's the good news. Michael in Satan in Revelation 12, there was an, an attempted coup in heaven. And he, he uh, Michael and his angels waged war against God, actually, there. Uh, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Then the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And it says there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Now, oh, I don't know what that does for you. That's one of the saddest statements almost in Scripture. That it felt like God was wanting still to redeem Satan. You see, Satan was this perfect, perfect angel full of wisdom and beauty and righteousness and wisdom. I mean, probably one of the most beautiful angels in all of heaven. And he waged war, but God said, I can't find any place for him in heaven. So where did he throw him? He was cast down to earth. The consequences of the revolt, he couldn't stay in heaven, Revelation 12, 12, 7. He was thrown down to earth, Revelation 12, 9. And in Luke 10, Jesus said, I watched him fall. So guess where Satan is today on the planet with a third of the angels who have now turned against the Son of God and guess who he's also, who they are also against? It, us, the kingdom of God, the people of, of Jesus Christ, the church. He wants to kill us, to steal, and to destroy. We know this. Well, let me just talk just a bit and I'm not going to get too deep into this. I wish I could because this really helped me see some things. Uh, you see, God is the, the creator and the originator and owner, original owner of planet Earth and the whole of the universe. You can see that in Genesis 1.1 and in Psalm 24.1. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We see that. But see, uh, when God created Adam, He turned over the authority of the planet to Adam. Do you see that? you remember that? How He said that? Now take... Take it and, and uh, rule the planet. So God took His authority and gave it to Adam. So Adam then was in charge of the planet. That, that, that's how I view it. And that's how I see it. Uh, without taking a lot of time to develop that, which I'd like to, but I can't. Uh, Satan, I believe now, has taken control over the earth. Now, let me just, I'll give you a few situations there. I believe now Satan is the, is the ruler of the planet. God had, owns it and created it, gave it to Adam, and I think Adam bartered it away at the fall. Now, that's where I think it happened. Now, uh, 
You see, purchase requires ownership. If I purchase something from you, you have to own it, right? Because in, in uh, Revelation 5, 9, and 10, he says, I'm going to, with your blood, I'm going to purchase men for God. Now, if God owns the planet and owns the people on the planet, why does he have to purchase them back? You see, I think ownership has been given over. For ownership of men had to be legal for that transaction to be legitimate. Now, let me just give you a few scriptures that speak to Satan being the Lord of this, this planet. Uh, John 12, 31. It just says, Now judgment is upon the, on this world. Now the ruler of this world, pretty clear, isn't it, shall be cast out. Now, why does Jesus have to come back in the end and overthrow Satan? If he's, if, 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 you see, he's, he's got to be in control if Jesus comes back to overthrow him and take back what was his. Uh, in John 14, it says, calls him the prince of, of this world. And in John 14, 28 says that John 16, 8 says, calls him the, the prince of this world. In um, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, calls him the God of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The God of this age. He's blinded so they cannot see the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 12, it just says, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, do we? We're wrestling with principalities and powers, demon, world forces. So we know there, we're even wrestling with that whole problem on, on the planet here. John, 1 John 4.4, 4, it says, You dear children are from God and, hope, and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Now that's good news, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Because Jesus now has come into us through salvation, and now He's implanted His kingdom within us, and as we pray and invite the kingdom of God into the temple of God, which we are the temple of God, that's what the Bible says. So we are, our bodies are, we literally are housing the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that's, that's a mind-blowing concept, but that's true. And as He is in us, we invite the kingdom of God which is in heaven into us and now he's working his kingdom on foreign territory through us. Now one of the scripture and this just nails it 1 John 5 19 says we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now that's about as clear as it gets. So um, you may disagree with that concept and that's okay. Wrestle with it a bit. I have a lot. And you have a freedom to not agree with me on that. That's all right. This is a way of making, a, uh, making sense of how we deal with evil. Now, look, another thing about uh, the temptation of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you've ever really worked through that. It says Satan or the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Right? Now, one of the temptations uh, was in Matthew 4, 8. And it says the devil, the devil took him, Jesus, to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, now listen to this, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now I thought, I used to think, now that feels illegitimate to me. If that is a real test then Satan had to own the nations of this world to be able to offer them to Jesus for that to be a legitimate temptation. You see that? And so it looks like there that the kingdoms of this world then did belong uh, to the devil. So I'm just going to leave it that part of it there. I think that's kind of the, the hard news. Now, uh, in one sense, things feel like they're getting worse, don't they? And that's what I was saying earlier. Because if Satan is in control of the planet, that will be the process. And we can hope for governmental change. We can hope for uh, politicians to fix our problems. And I tell you what, these days I don't have a whole lot of hope in that process. <clears throat> I, I, I'm involved in it. I'm kind of a news addict. 
and I watch it and I study it quite a lot, but I've just discovered they're not the answer. They're not the answer. So what are we to do in the face of evil around us? Romans 8.23 the first thing we need to do, and, and you can read through them, you probably know this Romans 8 passage as well as I do. The first thing it says, that we can groan and wait. That's what it says. Uh, we can groan and wait for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So there is a groaning going on. How many of you that are getting older, as it's getting easier? <laughs> Scott? To groan. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, uh, I, I received this gift from my mother. I hate getting old. <laughs> I can't tell you how I hate it. There are times under my breath I curse it, almost. I just can't stand it. I look in the mirror and I see my dad. And, you know, and, I, and it's weird. Uh, but I'm getting older and I've, I have some pains I didn't used to have. It's not, my body's not getting Younger is yours. If you do, we can make some money tonight. <laughs> but what we can do in the midst of this, it is, I love this, it's okay to groan and wait. It's okay. See, the earth is groaning and waiting for its redemption. See, in John 5, <coughs> excuse me, in John 5, after the scroll was opened and the future of the planet and the future of Christianity was revealed, then all of heaven, every animal, every bird and fish and everything on the planet and in the universe started singing praise and worship to the one that was worthy to open the scroll. It's one of the most incredible worship scenes, I believe, on, in the whole of Revelation because now the future is opened up. Evil is going to be dealt with. We've groaned and we've groaned and we've waited. And now it's happened. That's coming for us. We have hope. But it's okay to groan. Now I know that's a weird pastoral preacher type of thing to talk about. I've never heard anybody say that. It's okay to groan. That's part of what we do. Now don't get too, don't get too down in the face over this thing. But there are times when you can do nothing else but long and wait for the redemption of our body, for us to be complete again and whole. I can't wait till Scott gets his back straightened up someday. I can't hardly stand that, but someday it's going to happen. Mark's going to have a new heart, new kidneys. You know? But we groan. We groan. And we wait. It's a short time, but it's okay. And the second thing in Romans 8, 24 and 25, we can put our hope in God. That's what it says. For our, in hope we have been saved. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. You see, we sing all of those songs tonight. I just, I just thought about that. We have a longing for that mansion, that place of fulfillment, that place of completion. And I, I love the earth. I love the planet. I love Missouri. I love to hunt and fish. I love the stuff. I love birds and animals and trees. I love my family. I don't, I, I'm not saying that. I love that. But that's, that is transient. Someday, soon, forever, billions of years, forever, I'm going to be living in a perfect place without the pain, without the groaning. In Revelation 21, it says, There shall be no more tears or crying. These former things have passed away. And all things are going to become new. Oh my goodness, I can't wait. And now in the middle of this, in Romans 8, 26, and let the Holy Spirit help you. And here's the, here's the, a really good part. And in the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought or should. So the Holy Spirit is right in us. There in the middle of the groaning, sometimes He's groaning through us. Did you know that? It even says that in Scripture. And let Him do that. Let him, let him be the provider. Let Him be the one that's so near you uh, to help you through these things. <clears throat> I'm, I'm just almost finished. And I'll, I'll hurry here. Another thing in 1 Peter uh, 2.11. We even sang this tonight about being strangers. It was a soldier and pilgrims. I think we say. Pilgrims. 
And it says here in 1 Peter 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. <laughs> there it is. This is not our home. I'm just passing through. Yeah. And that's, that's true theology, guys. It's, it's true theology. So, so what you feel like an alien and a stranger here? It's okay. That's who you are. And if you get too comfortable here, then you'll never fully realize how the future of this thing looks. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's another. I, I want you to settle this issue. This one. I'm just. I'm just almost finished. What time we got? See, we got the time. Twenty-five after. Okay. Three more minutes. Okay. So I want you to settle this issue. It's Romans eight twenty-eight, and it says, "And we know that God causes all things." Now, most people stop right there. And we know that God causes all things. That's not true. That's not what it says. But some people think that God had to allow or cause the shooting in Connecticut. He had to cause Neil being uh, brutally attacked in the streets of Glasgow. No, He did not. God was not involved in that. That happened on the planet under the leadership and authority of Satan on the planet. Where do you think God was? I think He was grieving over that because He honors ownership and He doesn't step in and take over outside of invitation, but when we call Him in. So it, it doesn't say, and God causes all things. What does it say? God causes all things to work together for good to them who are called. So in the middle of what you're dealing with, in the middle of everything, when you can't cry another tear and you don't think you can take another breath or take another step the Holy Spirit is in you and you must come to the place of hope knowing that it is God who will turn that situation into His good if you will let Him because that is the promise He may not have caused those situations but He will cause them to work together for your good and for my good and see only God could pull that off and that's the hope on the planet. Now I know how to pray. Your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Bring your kingdom here. Well, if His kingdom is not here, why do we have to bring it here? You see? That's why we pray. That's why we pray. Your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. And now we walk out as aliens. Now we bring the kingdom and become kingdom people in a foreign territory as strangers. And we do it here for a season Grown if you like, but have hope that our God is going to provide for us. And in Isaiah 9 it says, deep, deep darkness has covered the people, but a child is born, and a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Amen.